VR, and I'm here with Nate Mitchell from Oculus and Paul Merlucky. You guys, if you're on our site, are already familiar, so I'm not going to further introduce them. You've probably already heard about the Crystal Cove uh, prototype that they're showing here, uh, so we want to kind of dig into some of the details here. So I have a list of questions, most of which I doubt you're going to be able to answer, but we're going to try anyway. <laughs> we'll do our best. Well, um, why don't you just start off with a quick explanation of what low persistence is and, and how you're using it and why it's better. A lot of people want to know uh, exactly how it works. We're using low per I'll start back to front. We're using low persistence because it allows us to eliminate motion blur, reduce latency, and make the scene appear very stable for the user. Um, the best way to think about it is a full persistence display. You render a frame, you put it on the screen, it shows, the, it, shows it on the screen, and then it stays on the screen until the next frame comes. Then it starts all over again. The problem with that is that the frame is only correct in the right place when it's right here. For the rest of the scene, it's kind of like garbage data. Uh, it's like so um, it's like a broken clock. You know a broken clock, how it's right occasionally when the hands move to the right place, but most of the time it's showing an old image, you know, an, an old piece of data. What we're doing with our low persistence display is rendering the image, sending it to the screen, we show it for a tiny period of time, then we blank the display, and then it's black until we have another image. So we're only showing the image when we have a correct, up-to-date frame from the computer to show. And if you do that at a high enough frame rate, you don't perceive it as multiple discrete frames, you perceive it as continuous motion. But because you have no garbage data, nothing for your retina to you know, try to focus on except for correct data, you end up with a crystal clear image. And, and part of that, the part of the, one of the missing features that was required to do low persistence was pixel switching time. We needed a sub millisecond pixel switching time, which we get from OLED technology to allow us to do all this. And to be clear, so pixel switching time is a big factor in motion blur, and we, I'd say we actually even used to think it was an even bigger factor, yes. and we drove pixel switching time down, 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 and once we started experimenting with displays that let us switch almost instantly, getting completely rid of this pixel switching time, it turns out that there are a lot of blur artifacts like Judder that look like motion blur even when the panel's perfect. If you put our panel under a high-speed camera, every single frame would be perfectly crystal clear. Whereas an LCD, you would see you know, a smeared blurry image because the pixels are switching. For us, it's always crystal clear. It's all in your brain, yep. this motion blur. And yep. it, 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 that's probably our, the biggest update that we've made to yeah. this prototype. It's a major breakthrough in terms of immersion, comfort, and actually visual stability of the scene. Now you can actually read text, um, not only because of the high resolution, but with text in the world before, even if you were moving your head just a little bit, which most of us naturally are as we're looking around the scene, and the text would just smear very heavily. Now with low persistence, all the objects feel a lot more visually stable and locked in place. And it's worth noting that uh, this, this technology will continue to be important for VR for a very long time. It's not a hack that gets around some issue we have right now. In, until we get to displays or in, in engines that can render at a thousand frames a second and display at a thousand hertz, basically display, displaying full persistence frames that are as short as our low persistence frames, uh, there's going to be no yeah. other way to get a good VR experience. It's really the only way yeah. that's known. And Val, Val, uh, Valve's Michael Abrash has a blog he posted like about a year ago talking about the potential for low persistence to solve some of these issues. Yeah. And right now there's no, no, no other way that we know of. And although uh, everyone's talking about the, the positional tracking, and that's awesome, and everyone's been looking forward to that, you guys were telling us earlier that you think the low persistence is, is perhaps a bigger, mm -hmm. more important breakthrough for now than, than the positional tracking. I, I mean, position tracking, it's, it's really good and it's important, but it's something we've always known that we needed to have, and so we were going to have to build it. It was unexpected. And that's obvious for any VR system. Any VR system where you're trying to simulate reality, you want to simulate motion as accurately as possible. We weren't able to do it in the past, but we knew it was going to happen for consumers. So low persistence is a breakthrough in that it was an unexpected, you know, it, it was, we did not expect to see that the kind of jump in quality that we saw. Yeah. Where we said, this isn't just one of ev those little every bit helps. It is it's a killer. It yeah. completely changes yeah. the way that, it completely changes the experience. Yeah, fundamentally. And so you were talking about the field of view. I know you don't want to get into specifics, but would you update people on you're using different optics now? And, uh, so, I mean, this is just a prototype. It's not using our final optics. It's not, everything in that is prototype hardware, and it's not necessarily the best in every different track of technology that we have, uh, but the field of view is equivalent to DK1. Okay. 
And can you, are you saying anything really, sp any, any, anything at all specific about the panel? It's, we know it's OLED. We know it's, uh, you know it's very low refresh rate. What do we do? Well, it, no, very high refresh rate. It's OLED. Um, 1080p. Very, 1080p. And that it has a very high refresh rate. Okay. And, and, and very low pixel switching time. Basically, the panel that we're seeing here is, is your bar, your threshold for the minimum you would do for consumer. Absolutely. Use. Um, can you tell us a little bit now about the positional tracking, why you chose to go with IR LEDs, and, and exactly how you chose the layout, things like that? We can't talk about all the specifics. <laughs> um, it's, a lot of this is still under R&D, but we've tried a lot of different tracking methods. We've tried magnetic and optical and ultrasonic and a few other, few other exotic tracking methods. And optical is definitely the front runner right now. The strengths and weaknesses of optical and inertial systems mesh together really well. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to ask about that picture from Wired that we kind of noticed. Which one? Uh, I know which Paul one. Paul had emailed about. had emailed you saying, "Is that a camera on the oh, wall tracking?" Yeah, the before you guys were talking about it, was that? Did you guys know that that picture was out there, or did you think, "Yeah, no one will notice"? And so we knew that picture was out there. Okay. Um, you left a little Easter egg. Well, it wasn't on. It just it happened. It just happened. It was okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, in that photo, it looks like there's LEDs on the back, but what we've seen here, there it's aren't. Just, yeah, that just, that's just confusion. Okay. Uh, there are no IR LEDs on the back of the headset, okay. just on the front shelf. But that being said, you guys were talking about how robust the rotation is. How yes. far would you say? It's hard to put an exact number on it, okay. but it's, it's pretty much anything you can do without lifting your yeah. butt out of the chair. What we've said here um, with Crystal Cove is that the positional tracking system, and this has really been a design goal for us, is uh, how do we get an optimal positional tracking system for design really for seated VR. So the goal is really that if you're being, if you're doing a normal range of movements in your chair, that we're capturing that really accurately and precisely ultra low latency um, for the experience to be good. And for us to make a system that, it would be great if we could do a system where you can walk around and track and do all that stuff, but that's a very different system with very different trade-offs that we would be building. And it doesn't make sense to build a tracking, actually I don't, I mean, you basically, there is no good way to do it right now. Yeah. We're, this is the this is a really great tracking system that works really well for CD VR. Yeah. And for the, can you give us some details maybe about the camera? Like how, how quickly is that capturing? How how? No, you can't tell. Can't us anything. give any details on okay. that either. I just it, you know we mentioned this earlier, but a lot of things we're not talking about. It's not because we're lame and we don't want to talk about it. And we want to keep it secret. We are working with other people, and we've always have had a policy of not speaking for other people, whether they're hardware or software companies. Yeah. It's. We, we don't want to be you know spilling their secrets or trying to explain their stuff for them. Yeah, okay. and I think one of the other key takeaways on positional and uh, low persistence is that with Crystal Cove, we're showing these features as they stand sort of today within the Crystal Cove prototype, but the reason we're showing them to you guys is really to show you the experience. And positional and low persistence, these are features we're con confirming for the consumer version of the Rift. So even though they may not be as polished or in their final forms as they will be down the road, that's what we're targeting to deliver for consumer V1. Okay. And I have to ask, um, do you guys remember seeing the Positron? Um, it was basically a, a precursor kind of to what you guys are doing. With LEDs all over it. It was made by a guy from... Uh, I'm familiar. Yes, I'm familiar with it. Um, did that have? Did that have any... Did you guys look at that at all and I mean, a we, long time ago? We say, saw it. There's, that might be an we saw it, but there's all... I mean, that... I know it's not. He didn't invent he, it, of course. But. So his system was interesting in that it was using RGB LEDs, mm -hmm. to, you know, so that you could identify mm -hmm. individual ones using color. Uh, so they was all very visible. Um, but you know, ours is an infrared system, and tracking infrared LEDs is something that's been used in professional motion capture systems for a very long time. Uh -huh. Like at the lab where I used to work, that was how we tracked it. We put infrared LEDs, but we were using this massive, really expensive professional motion capture system that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and we've been able to get that kind of performance out of something that we can put in a consumer product. And I want to backtrack slightly to low persistence. Uh, earlier I think you guys had mentioned that low persistence in addition to bringing up the visual fidelity reduces latency, is that correct? Yes. And how does that work? Kind of. Kind well, of. It, it, so of it's, it's not, it's that they all work together. You can't do low persistence without really fast pixel switching time. and. Fast pixel switching time also allows us to have very low latency. Yeah. Um, because I, we're, we're, as, as soon as the panel gets the frame, we're displaying it right. and it's instantly showing the correct image. Yeah, so I think if you look at the motion to photons latency pipeline that we've talked about a lot, pixel switching time has always been one of the key elements in there in that you know there's this major delay as the pixels change color. 
now that we've eliminated pixel switching time because of the OLED technology, um, it's not that low persistence is getting us, you know, even lower latency. Okay. But altogether, um, I think what's interesting is that at uh, E3 when we showed the HD prototypes, those demos were running between, you know, 50 to 70 milliseconds of latency for the UE4 Elemental demo. Here at um, CES 2014, we're showing the Epic uh, Strategy VR demo and Eve Valkyrie. Um, and both of those demos are running between 30 and 40 milliseconds of latency. So that's a pretty dramatic reduction, you know, in terms of the target goal, which is really delivering consumer V1 under 20 milliseconds of latency. And that is a goal we yeah. think we'll be able to pull off. So it is true, like, all, all these of the prototypes, <laughs> exactly, have had a, a latency reduction, but it's not necessarily that one you know, low persistence just is a silver bullet. But the text, I mean, it's, so it's the pixel switching time and also the higher refresh rate that, yeah. that you need for low persistence. It also helps with with uh, the latency yeah. of the system overall because you're showing an image more quickly. Yeah. And speaking of latency, have you guys been further developing your IMU? You guys have a custom <coughs> IMU uh, made by made by Nirav Patel, uh, or at least he, he started Made by the team at Oculus, yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, he had worked on one before he came to Oculus, yeah, but we have came, a whole team of people working okay. on it. Okay, and so then it does sound like you're continuing to work on that since the one that's in the DK1, is that correct? We continue to optimize all absolutely. of our virtual systems. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you're still hitting the same baseline uh, kind of numbers and stuff that you have before. Like it's better. Thousand. Okay. Um, yeah. And do you, I know you guys are completely busy with this whole other thing, but a long time ago you were planning on selling the tracker as an independent thing for, for other people to use if they wanted to. Is that anywhere on your on your radar right now? It, it's still some. It's still something it's, we're it's, it's on our It's on our radar, but we have to figure out how exactly we're going to do that. Like, one issue right now is that the trackers are made, calibrated, and then tied to to a unit. Yeah. So it's it's like, well, wait. And then also our SDK looks at them and it identifies them. It's yeah. like, well, how, do, how does that? It's not an easy thing where we can just say, all right, let's just start shipping yeah. the chips out. It, it's something we have yeah. to figure out how we're going to Absolutely. make it all Absolutely. There's a, it's just practical challenges too around distribution, logistics. I mean, it is you have to pay, it is figure an out, undertaking. Yeah, and you have to get, you have to do FCC testing for it again because it's now a new device. Yeah. So you have to, you know, build enclosures, get those tested, go through yeah. Everything. So it's something we'd like to do potentially in the future, but right now the focus really is all on just delivering the best consumer rift. And so Crystal Cove, that's a pretty cool exotic uh, prototype name. <laughs> what? Where's Crystal Cove? What's that from? It's just one of our internal code names. Okay. I when I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, it's like like there are crystals on it. No, it there was <laughs> nothing. We nothing we we, we have we have in some internal code names, and they don't have anything to do with right. with the prototype. This okay. this particular prototype prototype path just ended up being getting that code name. Yeah, cool. Crystal Cove is the one that made it here to CES. Got just it. Just by chance. Um, quick step back to latency. Um, how's demand on your uh, latency tester been? You guys launched that a couple months ago. It's been good. It's been pretty good. How many have we sold? I honestly don't know the number. Laird over there would know. But uh, instead of grabbing Laird, I think... Laird, how many latency testers have we sold? Are we giving out that number? Yes. No, about 300. About, three, three, about 300. See, yes, 300. 300. 300. 300. <laughs> 300 latency And now that's how many we've sold. We've actually given out a lot to developers, yeah, too. Okay, cool. So everyone we're working with, um, you know, like... Like on engines, we've given them a lot of latency. We've made a lot more than we've sold uh -huh. because we've been giving them out to so many people. Um, because those people really need it when you're actually developing engine integrations. They're making in changes that can really drastically reduce latency. Whereas a game developer, they're going to be able to do some things, but they don't have, you know, it's not, they don't have to go, they can't go as deep usually. Okay. Um, so when Paul spoke with you guys at Gamescom, we were asking, is there going to be Def 2? And you guys were like, no, definitely not. Um, I don't think you guys were being dishonest there, I, uh, because later you ended up announcing you were going to do it. So no, did that wouldn't. decision come afterward? I'd say what we've always said, and, and sorry if this was confusing to anyone, is that we always have wanted to do, we've always known that there probably needs to be second rev of dev kit hardware. Okay. It's very close to consumer. Right, because the challenge is, let's pretend we're Activision, right, or EA or some major publisher, and we want to build a game for the Rift. And before the Rift hits retail shelves, we need final hardware. It doesn't even matter if it's a big publisher, I just picked Activision. But, um, Same thing goes for any, any anyone, yeah, even anyone. small indies, anyone yeah, is going to need hardware before the launch right, so that they to can test it so that when we go to Best Buy and buy a Rift or wherever we go, um, that we know that the game is going to run perfectly on the retail hardware. So 
in that sense, we've always known there's probably needs to be a second rev of development kit hardware that is feature identical to the retail version. All that said, we don't have any timeline or release dates or, or any news or announcements to make around that. I mean, today it's all about Crystal Code. Um, but again, if there was hardware like that, it would have the same feature set of, as the consumer version. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Uh, so. Are you guys still aiming for 2014 for consumer model? Still I don't aiming. think we've ever said we were aiming for 2014. <laughs> oh, I'm going to pull some quotes on you guys. <laughs> You're right. There are some there are quotes, especially when you go way back where, you know, I, okay. where we're, He's right. Yeah. There so, are some hard quotes. So I think what you're trying to say is we're not launch in, it when it's done. Yes. As soon as and that's as soon as So it's part of the, the Series B, the, the new round of funding, really gives us the opportunity to do whatever we need, anything that we want to do, to build the best possible product. And we're still making a number of breakthroughs like low persistence. Some of the things you know they, they're unexpected to us and what a difference they make. So delivering all of that, the best consumer V1 we possibly can, that's our number one goal. Um, We'll see where we end up schedule-wise, but what we keep saying and we've been saying for a while is that 2014 will be a great year for VR. Fair enough. Nate and Palmer, thank you very much for joining us here and answering all our questions. We really appreciate it. It's Good luck great. with the rest of the show. Thank you.